Welcome to Trash Compactor. I'm Josh, and today we're continuing our coverage of the Star Wars prequels with the middle of the prequel trilogy, Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones from 2002. Joining me today is Russ. Hey. And Fry. Hello. So let's get right into it, guys. Attack of the Clones. What are your memories of seeing this the first time? Do you know when you saw this the first time, Russ? Uh, I I have no memory of, <laughs> of seeing it in the theater. Uh, very little. I know oh, I really? did. Yeah, I know. I know I did. Uh, I think I was still I still had the uh, the Phantom Menace hangover, so I don't know if I remember this film or I know I, I don't remember Revenge of the Sith almost at all. Um, but the, yeah, I had very little memory. I think I was excited for uh, like the Jango Fett uh, situation that I knew was going to be happening. I was, I was pretty pumped for that going in. That's all I really remember. Yeah. So if you don't remember seeing the movie, if that chance you remember this, but do you remember going in to see it? Did you know that it was Jango Fett and not the Boba Fett of it all? Or you just saw the armor in the trailers? That's a good question. I don't know if I'd given up like looking into like movie tidbits at that point. Like, uh, you know, when Phantom Menace was coming out, like I read everything I could, found everything I could. I don't think I, 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 I don't know if I had already given up at that point or if it was after this film. Might have been before. I can't recall. Well, yeah. that's interesting, that Phantom Menace hangover, as you term it. So, so so that was in, like, full effect for you then. Like, your enthusiasm for this movie, it sounds like, was lower than oh, yeah. oh, it for sure. have been previously. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Fry, what about you? What are your what was your first interaction with this, uh, also, with this text? This text. <laughs> this year text. <laughs> this year text. This year text. I uh, didn't see it in a theater, and I saw Phantom Menace in theater, but I didn't see this one in the theater, and I, I don't have any specific memory of seeing it the first time. I, don't, I think it was just on cable, and I just watched it with like no expression <laughs> on my face. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's interesting. So uh, would you say this, like, I guess we're just calling it the Phantom Menace hangover was also in effect for you then, so that's why you yes. didn't see it in the theater? I think so. I like. I don't think I was like super like specifically down on it, but I just kind of like it didn't wasn't a priority for me, and I just didn't have like I don't know. Like I was what seventeen, and like I guess had I don't other know, things on your mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I actually recall my first viewing experience. I actually this movie had a premiere. I don't think it was the premiere, but it was screened at the first Tribeca Film Festival. And it was my high school graduation present to get a ticket to the Tribeca Film Festival to see this premiere screening of Attack of the Clones. And I remember, um, oh, God, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. What's the guy? Oh, God, this is so embarrassing on many levels. Uh, what's the guy from Rescue Me, the comedian? Oh, Dennis, Dennis Leary. Leary. Yeah, yeah I, saw, I saw Dennis Leary there, uh, <laughs> like his, his kids. And he was like wearing sunglasses and looked like very... <laughs> Gonna go see Attack of the Clones. He's very put out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. He's yeah. very put out. <laughs> um, I love it. So, yeah, that's interesting. Like, I was still in Star Wars fan mode. I was, you know, I think it's interesting, this uh, Phantom Menace hangover you're talking about. I think that's something that was very real. I'm also wondering the degree to which you think some of the choices made in this movie were direct responses to reactions to the phantom menace like i seem to recall this perception especially when the trailers were coming out that this one seemed like more action-packed and less i don't know if it seemed like less silly or whatever oh oh it's silly it's silly <laughs> no 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 the lead up i'm not talking about the film oh, okay, I mean, okay. in the lead up there was a perception that it was sort of a course correction like i'm wondering if there's if you can recall a sense of that or if like you see anything in this movie that may be a response to the reaction from episode one well there was definitely the jar jar thing right that yeah the, that was like yeah the jar jar of it all yeah, the, and he, I guess he's in the movie less, but like, I remember, for some reason, I remember that, like, oh, they were almost like, like, yes, he's there, but he's like there for a second. Like, there was like, there was very much like an assurance like that. Like, don't don't worry, he's like, he's going to be gone, like, at the first 10 minutes. Well, you know, but they didn't, they didn't uh, hit him on the platform when they could have. So they saved, they spared us a early Jar Jar death in this film. 
Oh, you're saying like in that assassination attempt, like the bombing, like they just <laughs> killed him off? Jar Jar could have been stepping out to meet them and greet them and just totally uh, like like a victim of circumstance, like, uh, you know, wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't even, like, they don't even make it clear. Like, it's just like on repeat viewings. Like, you're like, wait a minute, is that Jar Jar? They just died there? <laughs> just like, in the distance, <laughs> never, never fully accounted for. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, but that's interesting, too, because I think George Lucas was definitely aware. Well, no, I know he was aware of the negative reaction to Jar Jar, and I know that affected him to the degree where, you know, very famously, his handwritten rough draft for episode two, the working title was Jar Jar's Great Adventure, (laughs) which was sort of like, you know, the the finger in the eye for the the critics and the... uh, the fans who shot all over Jar Jar, but um, well, real, real quick, can I, can I jump in and just ask if his name was not Jar Jar Binks, if it were anything else, would we have perceived him better? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> like, a little bit. Well, you know, you know, it's tricky. I mean, that's a good question. Like, not Jojo Boinks, Boinks feel... but you know, something <laughs> <laughs> Jojo Boinks. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah, you might be onto something. I'm pretty sure um, the name comes from something that his son Jet said when he was like a toddler. Mm. I know that that's also where the name Gungans also came from. But also, like, um, I don't think it's that out of line with other Star Wars names. Like, some of them are pretty yeah, silly. I mean, like, the thing that I keep coming back to, like, there's a temptation to, I mean, I think there's a sense that the names became sillier as time went on. Uh, but the thing that I keep coming back to is Greedo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like you know Darth Sidious and and like Sleaze Bango and like all those. Yeah, things. I was just... <laughs> oh, it's like Greedo. I mean, it's pretty much there from day one, isn't it? Right. For some reason, maybe because you know we grew up with Greedo, but I feel like I don't know. It transcends the, the term greed and becomes a whole. New, I don't know. It becomes a whole new thing. I don't know if that's true, but well, I think it's also like the like crystal skull like refrigerator thing like everybody hated those parts of like that indiana jones movie and like those were there going back to like raiders of the lost ark like that like mine train sequence or like uh or like chase sequence like was equally ridiculous the, the raft falling and temple of doom and like people have a tendency to like i don't know i think it's just the, kind of the way that it's presented in older movies like people forgive these things well, so that actually ties into something that I think we're going to be talking about in this movie. And it's something that I argued on the Phantom Menace show we did, where I think you're right. I think there is this line of silliness and cartooniness that I think is kept in check by the fact that in earlier days, you had to achieve all of this practically. Somehow you had to physically create this effect whereas with the era of the prequels and cgi you can do literally anything except it's untethered by the need to behave according to the laws of physics so you you kind of end up with this kind of cartoonier it's like slightly on the other side of the line of like too cartoony because there are no physics you have to create all the physics so it shares that in common just inherently with like cell drawn animation where like you have to create it all like it's not just going to react naturally because it's a physical thing that you're photographing it's like you are creating everything including the physical laws that it has to um, yes and then there's an understanding that you you've achieved that even if you didn't do the thing that's on screen that you've achieved that in some physical way like whether whether it's through like models or like or like it, there's some like there's an understanding that like there, like it's, it's like of course yeah like it's like it's some kind of it's like a science project of some kind that was that you're seeing it slash magic trick yeah i mean it's also like um you know i remember this uh one thing on the attack of the clones dvd very specifically uh john Knoll, the visual effects supervisor and the co-creator of of photoshop he's like reviewing this shot of um dexter jetster i believe the character's name is and he's talking about like the the specular highlights and how they're the like specular highlights of the light are like reading on his head and i'm just thinking to myself like you know specular highlights is not something you have to worry about when you're photographing um, <laughs> uh, a puppet or a maquette or something it's like when you are creating cg things you, you like literally have to create the light too <laughs> right yes 
And like, there are just all these little things that I think we are all subconsciously going to pick up on, you know, whether we're aware of it or not. Um, and that is ever like CG effects. I feel like that is always like that's the battle that they're getting better and better at is like um, making you make it so you don't uh, notice that those things aren't there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like one of the ways to do that is to be very judicious with how you utilize it. And I think, you know, something that they're doing now, I mean, obviously the technology is, you know, like you said, improving all the time. But also I think the approach to it now is like you get as much real physical stuff in the shot, like in camera as you can. And you you kind of you augment with CG, you know, like in the newer films, the newer Star Wars films, a lot of the aliens are physical creatures and then they just like CG yeah. in the like facial expressions and stuff and like they kind of augment what's there. So like you get the best of both worlds. Attack um, of the Clones, by the way, is I feel like this is like the, the king of the like dumb physics of, out of the Star <laughs> Wars movie. Like there is so many just like like falling like plummeting down like so far and just kind of like gently landing on things or like uh when i think uh when obi-wan like throws his like a grappling hook like on kamino he's using the force doesn't make any sense (laughs) no no no. it's force it's force guided force guided force landing but like the way that he's reacting to it though like his body like i guess yeah oh oh, that i agree with his own body (laughs) yeah some of the physics are really weird on this (laughs) <laughs> no, yeah, and like um, uh, Padme, I know, has several falls that seem to defy the laws of physics. And yeah, it's like, you know, things just don't really have like a weight that you would expect them to have. And there's like, I'm getting really ahead of myself, but um, I do think the CG, the CG of it all, and this is not me condemning CGI as like a concept. I don't think it's not a good thing. I just think that you know, it has certain drawbacks and good uses and certain less good uses. And I think both of those are on full display in this movie. The other thing, too, is that this is the first feature film shot on high definition video. There was no film. I believe they call it image acquisition in the biz. Uh, There was no film involved in the image acquisition in the production of this movie. It was uh, shot on uh, prototype Sony high def video cameras. I believe mastered at 1080p, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. Yeah. Which I think also creates this kind of unique look that's very specific to the time. It's it's specific to something. Yeah. (laughs) It's got a look. I I kind of like. Like, there is some of the special edition, like, kind of, like, dumbass, like, Muppet, like, um, kind of, like, creature designs in this. But there's some that I kind of like in this movie. Like, kind of, like, the like CG execution aside, like, I like some of the designs. No, yeah, I mean, some of the design work, I mean, yeah, I think in all these movies, like, the design work is really, you know, there's a lot to love, certainly. It's just, I find, it's, like, hard to know what to focus on sometimes, like, because there's so much wall-to-wall stuff. Can I jump crazy um, ahead and tell you my favorite ship in the in the film? Yeah, go ahead. I like um I like Dooku's ship only with the solar sail. I think that's I think that's very nice. It's funny. It's uh, funny you mention that because that ship drives me crazy. <laughs> because it's like it's like, I don't know, like I'm sure this is very specific to me and the Venn diagram of like my interests. But like in this universe where like we just accept the magic of faster than light travel, like to all of a sudden have something like very like real and scientific and also like not a very like, I don't know. It's like a solar sail ship. The way that it's depicted in this movie, it like wouldn't. It's like I don't know. Like it doesn't belong on the screen with like ships that like jump into. Oh, it makes ships zero with, like, sense. Like lifts and yeah, it makes no sense. But but you know, I could I could see Dooku on a ship like we're on a cruise. I'm in no rush to get anywhere. I'm gonna have my, I'm gonna have my space tea. I'm gonna put my feet up. I'm gonna put on my space Victrola. I'm gonna listen to my my old Tommy Jedi <laughs> Jedi records, <laughs> and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna travel to see uh, my Lord and Emperor, and I'm just gonna take my time. He's not in a rush. We have all the time. We have all the power. I kind of I mean, that's like, the Duke, vibe I get Duke, from it. Like Dooku, <laughs> space is implied. You don't have to keep saying space on everything. <laughs> <laughs> For the benefit of the audience, <laughs> the listening audience. <laughs> well, let me ask you: When you saw that ship deploy its sail, like, did you immediately know what it was? 
Yes. It's like, oh, like that's a... <laughs> oh, you know, absolutely. Oh, you oh, yeah. I mean, that's just like, oh. it's a, you know, being a, being a nerd, I was like, oh, solar sail. That's a, a clever new design that George really <laughs> liked. You know, it's like, it's like, hey, something different. I thought, though, what I liked about it, because there's no talking, there's no dialogue, we're really just watching a uh, ship travel. And I feel like we kind of missed that in, in Star Wars a little bit. Uh, like, I want to see a slow shots. I want to see uh, ascent, descent. You know, I want to see... And, and that's that's one of the things I think I like about this movie. Um, I mean, it has many flaws, um, and I didn't I didn't really care for it back when it first came out. And I will say my opinion of it has changed considerably. I still think it is uh, not by any means uh, my favorite f- uh, of the Star Wars films, but I like it more now. And there are things about it that I see a lot of value in. And I like some of the pacing. I like some of the uh, the length of time it takes to get places to do things. Um, I wish there were more of it, actually. It feeds yeah, into actually, that kind of slow pace, uh, like you know, people call it the Star Wars noir. Uh, it has some of that. Let, like, let's wait and see. Let's wait and see. Let's watch this. I want more of that show. Don't tell. Yeah, that is something I was like when I was watching. I'm like, this is something I do miss from not only the newer Star Wars movies, but just movies in general. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. There is nothing like that. Just like when you somebody see- getting somewhere, <laughs> like uh, even like <laughs> at a reasonable rate. I don't, like I was like <laughs> kind of watched like the first like scream fairly recently, and like there was a scene where like Nev Campbell's character comes home and like it just kind of follows her as there's like a sunset in the background, and it's like setting that scene. And like I feel like that's something you would never see in a movie where it's just this character kind of like walking up like their their porch, and like it's like this well framed shot of the sun going down in the background for like 30, 45 seconds. That's that's an age, yeah. So just to be clear, we are praising the time that that the film takes to show people like traveling or just kind of like Let's... to get a sense of like how things might feel like if you were like in that world and like you were like next to this person, like just mm-hmm. for a little bit. Like, I mean, there's like a, a point where it's too much and like you're just kind of like, all right, this is getting like boring. But like, like Russ <laughs> said, like it's like kind of following him just kind of I don't know. I feel like it's kind of like immersive in a way, like in a way where. It's like I feel like I'm in this room or this ship right now. And it's just kind of like I can feel it's a little bit of that like alien original alien where everybody's waking up and like everybody's talking over each other. And Duke's ship also is kind of a reflection of his personality. Here you got like this kind of old timey Jedi master turned, and here's this like old timey, like old like pre old republic potentially ship and technology. It's like, no, no. You know, I've had the ships uh, since it came out. I'm just, you know, I, I, you know, I maintain it. I keep it up. I wax it. Uh, I've been, I've been flying the same ship for years. I see no reason to buy a new ship. Uh, sure, you know, new amenities. A lot of people get new ships, but I'm, I'm good with my ship. I think it's, I think it's a great ship. It gets me where I have to go. Very reliable. You know, it's like, like driving an old <laughs> boat around town. You know, it's, it's, uh, and so I feel like it reflects his character, and that is something I feel is extremely specific and nuanced, and I like it. I, I like it a lot. I, I miss things like that. So now I like that show. Because <laughs> uh, that's interesting because, like, you know, one of the things that for me I think this movie does is it's sort of there's a lot of travel. Things travel at the speed of plot. You know, I think like, you know, when the Jedi show up miraculously at the end and save the day, it's sort of like when they were on Tatooine that they're like so much closer to Geonosis than from Coruscant. So like they have to go and it's just like, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that is always kind of tricky in these movies and try not to think too hard about is like the speed things travel and how big the galaxy actually is. Because like sometimes they travel around the galaxy, you know, like it's New York City. And sometimes they travel around the galaxy like it's, you know, the entire planet. And it's like, well, wait, is going from this planet to that planet like going from one borough to another? Or is it like flying from one country to another or a continent? It's like... I wonder why that if that's part of the reason why things tend to take place on just like the same few planets more and more. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that you uh, you could be picking up on it like might have to do with the fact that so much of the plot hinges on the physical separation of the leads, and it's like okay, you are going to travel here with her and you are going to travel to this other far off spot and like do your yeah. thing so I mean, it's like this full-blown like a b story structure like <laughs> i feel like more than like any other movie like they it's just obi-wan scene anakin scene obi-wan scene anakin scene 
Yeah, I mean, it is kind of interesting. Like the other, we noted this in the Empire Strikes Back pod we did way back when. That's the only other Star Wars movie that I can think of that like very specifically and deliberately separates the characters. And it kind of does a similar thing to the point where I almost have to wonder if it was knowingly done this way. But sort of the two characters that have to fall in love are sort of separated together. And then like, you know, the Jedi has to go off and do Jedi stuff all by their lonesome. Really? Well, one of the things that I think is interesting, Russ, you alluded to it earlier. The movie starts off with a bang, a literal explosion, the first of several assassination attempts on Padme's life. And, you know, what do you think of the way the movie starts out? Uh, unexpected for Star Wars. Um I mean, Star Wars, I think, like, one of the ideas is, that, like, the action's already happening, and we're just kind of peeking in as it's going. So, like, it's already going. Get get involved. Like, get hooked get hooked quick. Uh, this one, this one's a little slower, because we kind of get to see the lead up to it, in a way. I mean, I guess the action is already happening, of course. But I, I appreciated it, more so now, because, like, it says the tone. It is a little, a little bit off, a little bit, a little somber, a little little um you know the, the, even in the musical cues in in general in the score it's kind of leading you to believe like things are things are a little different here uh, at, this time around and then to go into a plot driven by a mystery like uh, who done it i think that's that's interesting to me it's it's different uh for sure um in the theatrical cut you know like you know pretty quickly there's there's some some shadowy people not so shadowed you know giving direction there's layers of of bounty hunter mercenaries uh in, potentially involved in this uh in this plot uh you know what what their driving action is you're not quite sure yet you know what the cause of but um, it pulled me in it pulled me in pretty quick um uh, again more so this time around being able to look at it with some some time and distance away from seeing it you know theatrically or I guess we'll talk more about like the Hell 9000 cut later, but like the, even like that, that's like one kind of edit there that kind of enhances, I think what Russ is talking about where like they he pretty much like cuts the like dialogue, all the dialogue before that explosion happens. So it's even more jarring. So like, I guess technically, yeah, you are, it's like you're in the middle, coming in the middle of action in the sense that like you're seeing a ship come in and you don't know exactly where they came from. But like the first thing you see is just somebody like exiting and then there's an explosion. <laughs> no, yeah, I actually think the opening of this movie is really effective. Uh, like you were saying, Russ, like it is very moody. The music is very like sort of sort of ominous and kind of mysterious. Like it's the, cloud the, cover. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's cloud cover. I think it is more effective in the HAL 9000 cut for the benefit of the audience. So HAL 9000 is a fan editor. He's been a guest on this podcast a couple of times, and he has a fan edit of Star Wars Episode 2 that I think I've said several times on the podcast, like his his edits of the prequels are my go-to versions of the prequels because I think they do things like you said, Fry, where he just, he nips and tucks and like, you know, he took out the the dialogue where the characters are just sort of stating the obvious and removing it actually really enhances the effect of what's actually happening in the scene. Yeah, that cut makes this a straight up good movie, I think. <laughs> like this is like, as a first uh, album. 100% agree. Yeah. 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 <laughs> No, yeah, which I think, you know, really says a lot. I think it really speaks to the fact that the devil really is in the details. Like, there's a good movie in here. Yeah. And I think, you know, the existence of the HAL 9000 edit of the movie is really testament to that fact. It's like that version of the movie, to my mind, is, is like a good movie. Whereas I think the theatrical cut of the movie, it's sort of, there's a lot of good stuff, obviously, because like the HAL cut is just working with the raw materials of what was in the theatrical cut. And in that beginning, when 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 the, the, the Naboo, uh, I don't know, like luxury diplomatic ship is is cutting through the clouds, it's like one shot, and you see it's really, like a really wide wingspan. It's got this very like steampunky looking thing where you see Coruscant uh, totally clouded up. And it's just like really magical. I'm like, no, that is the best looking shot you have. Like linger, linger there. We've never, we haven't seen like a future city, like with the total cloud le level, like masking the whole city. It was, I thought it was really beautiful and kind of uh, one yeah. of those. And kind of the opposite yeah. of the original Star Wars aesthetic where, yeah. I mean, I guess it's like what the whole the prequel trilogy is about like visually, but like, that's a good example of a, like. This is the opposite of beat up garbage. <laughs> like this is... there, there is a lot of clean yeah. lines. I mean, Nabu particularly, like you have kind of old, old world looking um, planet, like buildings, very, very, like very Italian. I think they, they were shooting in Italy for parts of that. 
um, if I recall. But yeah, yeah. very, very clean, um, very new, very, very like pop art colors at times, like I think like the Naboo Starfighters. Uh, and yeah, I think it's good contrast. And I remember, you know, watching those George Lucas interviews on the VHS tapes where he's like, I, you know, I wanted, I wanted a cold white planet. I wanted a, a dense green planet. Like he wanted, he wanted the planets to change uh, and be very dramatic. And I feel like maybe it's not as dramatic um, all the time, but between uh, Coruscant, Camino, like we get like different weather systems, different styles. And I feel like they, they try to push it in this film, which I also enjoy. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly true also, like, those interviews that uh, you're talking about on the THX remastered versions of the the original trilogy on VHS in the 90s. And yeah, like, that stuff that George Lucas is talking about, you know, each of the environments in those three movies has, like, a very particular color palette and design sensibility. And one of the things that he says, I even think he says it in that interview, is that you know, there are only so many environments that you could find on planet Earth. And now with the advent of CGI, he does things that he uh, he couldn't have done then. Like he does a water planet. He's got the city planet. I don't know what you would call Geonosis at the end. It's sort of a... Uh, like it's like a Monument rocky. Valley planet, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. 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 It's yeah, like, like a Western yeah. planet. Dusty, dusty, rocky, um, Western. It's kind of spaghetti Mars, Western, basically. It's John yeah. Carter Mars. Oh, they, that's actually <laughs> yeah. the last description. Yeah. yeah. Fry wind, so that's actually which... A good, yeah, Fry wins. Something I want to talk about. I mean, we'll get that later. The, some of the creature design is actually done by, I think, Terrell Whitlock. Like the, yes. Yeah. And she worked on that movie as well, which kind of tracks. Like she, like. Um, oh, that makes like sense. I remember thinking that movie. She created like the shocks, I think they're called. Like the kind of, I, I think of it like the tick sheep creatures that like Anakin rides on. Like. Yeah. While she's with. Yes. And like. Right. Yeah. And she's like very, like she knows a lot about animal anatomy which i think kind of you can get a sense of that like with some of the she didn't design all the creatures this movie and i think some of them are that are actually more expressionistic and like but the like ones like that are you can you can see that there's like a lot of like anatomy going on yeah she was interviewed i think in the light and magic documentary i believe oh was she i think i, I don't think i saw the last couple episodes of that i forgot to finish watching that so, so something i'm thinking of because we're, we're kind of at the beginning and we um uh I guess not to, to re- rehash the plot, but because this assassination attempt, the Jedi Council is contacted and we get thrust into our plot. Um, Anakin is going to, to be, I guess, chaperoning or bodyguarding Padme. Uh, and I think what's what's interesting for me is knowing that this is it. This is the film where he's grown up and he essentially has to fall in love, vice versa, with Padme to make that connection. And so for me, watching the theatrical cut and then watching the Hal, Hal 9000 cut like drastically different films because that that to me this whole thing hinges on that moment uh, or, or not that moment but that that process of those two reconnecting and then falling for each other in, in like a really deep way that has to carry through to be the driving force behind Anakin's or or, or most of Anakin's turn and, and to kind of highlight his emotional flexibility and, and the, I just have to say off the bat, like the Hal 9000 cut totally nails it. It eclipses and fixes, it nips and tucks, as you say, uh, all the problems I had, which basically is any of Anakin's uh, emotional outbursts and, and just the fact that they, they linger on them. Everyone's watching him uh, in, these, in the very beginning scenes having outbursts and like very childish to the point where uh, no, no, mod- no woman's going to uh be attracted to that 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 like that petulant type of childish behavior that's highlighted in the theatrical cut it's like push is like that is his character he is he is a like not even angsty teen he's just a he's a a child and yeah how long does cut totally basically trims it to the point where he actually seems stoic in a lot of scenes and that to me uh is really it it sells me i'm like all right he's stoic he's he's a little brash but he's he's exciting and a stoic yeah, that's why I don't think like um like Aiden Christian's performance is even bad. Like it got a lot of like for like everybody called like wooden, which I think those were the best parts of like his performance and like cutting out like the part where he's just kind of a whiny creep for like forty percent of the creep time. Is a, yeah, no, whiny <laughs> creep is good. Is good. Um, you know, one thing that I will say is like Russ, I I do echo your feelings about how Anakin comes off in this movie, and also how much Hal's edits really almost completely fix that problem. Uh, one thing that I will say is that that in the decades since this movie has come out, I think there's like an inadvertent commentary on kind of that uh, whiny entitledness is a certain kind of 
an archetype that I recognize now in the real world that I don't know was clear to me at the time, maybe because I, I was whiny and entitled when I was however old I was in 2002. But um, there's something about the portrayal of the depiction of the character in the theatrical cut that rings a little uncomfortably true in a way to me now that it did not 20 years ago. And I don't know if that's just like my perspective changing as I get older or the omnipresence of like, I mean, if you were to create a villain character that you weren't supposed to like now, you would create something like the way Anakin Skywalker is depicted in the theatrical cut whiny and entitled yeah, but know, I guess hockey for no reason. Yeah, there. But there, I guess there is something he said about like. I mean, he is an, a villain at this point, and there was something he said about just kind of like throwing like recognizable, embarrassing behavior on screen for your protagonist. <laughs> no, man, I'm with you. No, no, no. I don't think it's effective for what this movie thinks it's doing. Right. Like, I don't think that that's what the movie thinks it's doing. I think that it's. I mean, I'm honestly not quite sure what it thinks it's doing. <laughs> so, um, so it's like, it is very clear to me that I don't think a lot of thought has been given to the interiority of Padme, like, uh, because I don't know how, how anyone could look at Anakin Skywalker in this movie and be like, yeah, that's a desirable, uh, that is a specimen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like that is a specimen. Like I just don't, it's almost like nobody thought about what this would seem like through Padme's eyes. That's all that matters. That is the, the, the most important perspective of his character, in my opinion, in the film. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it, interesting but, because I think there's something to like, you know, um, Star Wars has, has always been touted for its depiction of strong female characters. And while I think that's true in a sense, like, yes, but the movie is not really concerned with, like I said, the interiority of these characters. It's like it, the movies aren't told. These aren't stories about the women. Like the women are just there as like supporting players for the men. So like what they think or how they feel is only important insofar as it affects what the male protagonist feels and that's it like i feel like it's interesting that the how now how nine thousands fix for that is to kind of remove i guess the interiority for for anakin but just kind of like a lot of that attitude and his perspective because like one of my favorite kind of major changes are is the uh that kind of romance section where it's they cut out the fireplace he cuts out the fireplace scene and like he uh and it's just that kiss that i think he changes it to nighttime and it's just like a 30 second scene of the kiss that like it's cut off and it's just like very effective. Everything is communicated like the kind of the passion of romance between them. And like, even the fact that it, he dims the scene kind of like makes their expressions like a little bit more passion filled. And it's just kind of like, that's all you need to know. Like, and you don't have authority for either of them. Like you just understand that these are two people that are falling in love and like, and it's just a an insanely economical, like kind of change that like they cut out, he cuts out like, just almost all of that whole section and it's so much better i gotta say if you want to really like score some points and really connect with your partner or maybe someone new in your life you need to get away to naboo like that is <laughs> that is the the date destination you got this like island airbnb going on they're they're having picnics uh it's it's really like that's it they're 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 in this big field it's, it's like a like a like a monet painting it's that that's a romantic destination, Nabu, if I've ever seen one. It's like nothing could be helped. Like like even even if he's a petulant child in his behavior, you get out to Nabu and things just change. It all just falls <laughs> yeah, away. Melts away. Melts away. <laughs> <sighs> well, you know, yeah, like what you said, Fry, is really true. Well, what both of you said, like the romance plot is so much more effective by leaving things unsaid and just like letting it play out with looks and without the dialogue yeah and um, also the scene with padme's family was great too because like that i feel like it's almost like cribbing from like a rom-com where like it's just like you're seeing it through a family's eyes and like so like he, we can tell that he loves you or like he's into you like they're looking out <laughs> through the window like it's such like a rom-com scene but it works so well because it's just kind of it does the heavy lifting perspective of like yeah. their relationship 
Yeah, well, it's interesting, too, because it's also like, you know, you said before that we sort of lose Anakin's interiority, but like, I don't think we do. Like, I think what happens is by cutting out the dialogue, you put the two of them on an equal playing field. Right, right. And I think you infer the interiority. Exactly, Rather yeah. than like you're hearing one person sort of like vomit out exactly what he's feeling <laughs> and thinking, right. and the other one is like, "What are you doing? Stop it!" <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's sort of um. So what you just brought up though is a really good point because now in the Hal cut where he restores these deleted scenes of them staying with Padme's family on Naboo, you do for the first time you get the hint that maybe Padme is actually interested in Anakin. And that's not something that you ever get in the theatrical cut, like the hint that, oh no, it's on her side also. So when she professes her love for him at the end in the theatrical cut, it's 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 sort of like, whoa, like where did that come from? Like I I thought you were like very over this dude who's like creeping on you. And then all of a sudden you do this like heel turn. Uh, whereas in the how cut, you do have a moment where you get a hint that she's attracted to this guy. Yeah. And by the way, I like in the theatrical cut the way that, that, that they get around that is that they have a scene earlier where she's like, we can't do this. And then like, so then like when she professes her love, his love her love for him, like later, he's like, what really? I thought you said that. And it's just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, that's what we're thinking too. Like what really? <laughs> but you said no. <laughs> you said, you said we wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I think comparing the Hal cut to the theatrical cut is actually really profound in what it reveals. Because, like, if the only change he made was the cutting out of certain bits of dialogue, how much more effective that makes the scenes that, like, the dialogue is supposedly working in service of. You know, it's an interesting thing. Like, this isn't a problem that just this movie has it's like when a writer is writing a movie they need to express ideas and communicate ideas through the words on the page like someone needs to be able to read it and clearly understand what's going on and like you do that through dialogue and then you shoot it that way and then like usually what happens though is like you realize oh okay like now that i'm seeing it and i see the expression on the actor's faces and i see the physicality and i see what's going on like we don't need that line in there like you know we can cut that line and i just feel like what happens in this movie is all of those lines are left in. So it's sort <laughs> yeah. of like, you know, and that happens a lot. It's like, you know, you'll have a writer will like write out a whole monologue for a character to say. And then like, you know, you get on set and the actor's like, I mean, I'll say this, but like, I could just convey all of this in like a look. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, you can, can't you? <laughs> I can. So, so, um, you know, one of the, the tricky things about translating a written script to the screen, uh, you know, through performance, through shots, through, through editing. Um, that was an, another hell cut was the, uh, when they're chasing the assassin. And, um, I mean, there is also, they cuts out the Anakin losing his lightsaber, but like right after that, they also cut their entrance into the club. And like, uh, when Anakin is like, I want to chance him. He's like, I'm trying, like, I am trying. You're like a father to me, but it's just like this very, like, it just sounds like it doesn't mean it. And then like, it doesn't like, it just it seems, it seems like something you shouldn't be saying there. And that cut just works better for that for other reasons too, because like, there's like 20 seconds of like their point of view looking around. That's just kind of like a weird pacing thing that they fixes. But I like that they cut out that line about the father because he says that later on to Padme in a very like much more emotional moment where it's just like, yeah, Oh, where, like, he actually where it sounds yeah. like, yeah, where it sounds like he means it. It's like he yeah. won't say it. He wouldn't say that to Obi Wan's face. Uh, yeah, but like you know, uh, like when he's emotional, like he admits it to her. Yeah, it's just really incredible. I think it really speaks to the power of editing and how less is more when you compare these two versions of the movie. You know, Russ, you said something about how uh, this sort of like Star Wars noir. And, like, it really is, like, you know, the extent where, like, the beginning in the clouds is, like, a very, like, noirish sort of a thing and, like, playing with light and stuff like that and, like, obscuring things with the fog. Um, there was a Vice documentary series that came out last summer about the making of Star Wars. I happened to be re-watching uh, re it recently because that's what I do in my free time. I re-watch things about the making of Star Wars that I've seen already. And it... Um... <laughs> 
And, you know, one of the interviews they had in that was with Jonathan Hales, a writer who um, who wrote on Young Indiana Jones. And he um, he's credited as the co-writer for this movie. And he said that when he met with George Lucas about writing this movie, he said George had two things. He had the beginning of the movie, which I assume is like the assassination attempt. And he had the end of the movie, which is they get married at the end. And like he and George Lucas sort of had to hash out like what <laughs> the story was, like everything that happened in in between the very beginning and the very end. Um, and I do think it's interesting that they utilize like a very genre plot structure to kind of fill in the blanks. Right. It's like, well, let's, you know, make this like a detective noir yeah. procedural. procedural. I, mean, I mean, there's Venetian blinds in, in that in like the night scene. <laughs> yeah. Like you're, it's it's like dead on noir, um, you know. Of course, with like you know killer slugs, but it's all there. Like, and it's also dark. It's moody, and then it goes right from a noir to a Fifth Element meets Blade Runner uh, air chase, which I think is actually pretty good as one of the action sequences. Um, I enjoyed it more than pod racing. Well, yeah. this is kind of the the pod race equivalent of this movie. It's sort of yeah. Yeah, I don't have it in front of me, but but I feel like it probably even happens at the same like runtime uh, like there, in the movie. It's there, like, it's, it's very wait, long. Is that early? Or this is this is pretty early in the movie. Yeah, it's pretty uh, early, but but it actually yeah. goes on for quite a while. What's interesting too is it's so like visually you have these like moments of Blade Runner. There's even almost like like uh, uh, you know fires off in the in the, the far parts of the city. Uh, it has that kind of future city feel. And then, like, it does have some kind of, like, fifth element, like, taxi cab comedy going on in it, right. too. Um, and then also... Taxi you, cab comedy. <laughs> and then also you find out that Jedi are essentially, you know, space uh, wizard superheroes because they're, yeah, they're, they're slowing themselves down. They're, they're leaping out of things. Leaping through transparent steel? So, like, uh, having read a lot of Star Wars novelizations, I want to say they explain the transparent steel uh, w- windows on a spaceship. Um, so, I mean, essentially, Obi Wan threw himself through like like the quote of strength of like metal. Uh, but anyway, I mean, logic, logic aside, uh, he used the force to push the molecules away as he jumped through. Uh, but he, it's cr- it's a crazy action sequence that I think is actually very exciting uh, for the movie. Um, and that's like our first kind of taste of action. And some lightsabers are, are you know, uh, ignited. But that's that's the most interesting of the sequences until we get to, um, I guess, the Camino fight, and then later the the asteroid uh, bombing, uh, like remote mine uh, sequence, which I also think is actually pretty good. By the way, I, I like to think this is like some intentional mild hypocrisy on Obi Wan's part, like um, or uh, George Lucas like intended the hypocrisy. But like, I feel like when he's kind of trying to uh, kind of like he's chastising a uh, Anakin about like, no, we're we're gonna stick to the mandate. Um, like <laughs> investigation is not part of that. Like we're not good. Like we're just protecting. Like we're just protecting. But then like once like the assassination attempt happens with the slugs, the first thing Obi Wan does is jump out the window to completely leave the person that he's, that he's supposed to be protecting to chase down and find out who this is. Not, not only that, but it seems like it's happened before because Anakin's like, all right, let me go get a ship to go catch him. Like, it, yeah. seems, it seems like Obi-Wan is <laughs> like, like, this is his first move. Like, I'm jumping through a window anytime. Like, <laughs> defenestration in Star Wars is, like, essential. <laughs> um, no, and it's also interesting, too, uh, to go on, like, the intentional hypocrisy thing because, so Obi-Wan he doesn't skip a beat. He jumps right out that window <laughs> without knowing what's <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> like he just, he just, he, he jumps without looking. And then minutes later, I mean, Anakin more or less does the same thing when he jumps out of the speeder. And then Anakin's like, I hate it when he does that. It's like, you just did the same fucking thing. <laughs> yeah. But I like when I, I do it. Just I just hate that. it when he does it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, do well, as I the, say, not as I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, and you know, there's this interesting um, observation that friend of the podcast, Chris, made on the Phantom Menace episode that, you know, he thinks that, like, one of the things about the Obi-Wan Anakin relationship is that it's not really so much father and son. It's it's they're more like brothers. And yeah, and Obi-Wan is more like a child raising a child. Yeah. Mm. Uh, which I think is actually a very good observation uh, because like a part of the thing in the original trilogy is that, you know, Obi-Wan was like, I thought I could train him, but like 
he wasn't ready. And I think going off the Phantom Menace, we get Obi-Wan, he's still an apprentice to Qui-Gon, and then he jumps right from apprentice to master. Like, he wasn't necessarily ready to be a master. He may have been ready to be a Jedi on his own without a master, but was he ready to train another Jedi? Yeah, no, I I think think that's exactly it. And like, I like the, actually, I think the kind of elevator scene at the beginning supports that because like when I talk about the gun darkness, yeah. like, <laughs> first of all, I love that because I think that's like one of the scenes where uh, you make has a fake beard because he was like, he is, a black yeah. dog down. but like, he just like, and he's like, as I recall, like I was going to say, he was like, oh yes. And he does that weird, like, it sounds like an ADR, like chuckle, like his mouth isn't like uh, open at all. And he's just like, it's like, <laughs> 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 I think he was trying to do an Alec Guinness. That, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I don't know. It's, it's yeah, it's like, but it's it, in that case, like, it says it comes off like very condescending and like. <laughs> no, but you know what's funny though? Oh, you just made me realize like uh, there's another scene. There's another exchange between them where Ewan McGregor also has like the fake facial hair. So it was also obviously in the reshoots. And it's another example where he does like a very, like a very clearly intentional Alec Guinness impression when he's chastising Anakin outside the club about losing his lightsaber. And he's like, oh, this right. weapon is your life. And it's, just, <laughs> and it's like, so you're making me wonder like it. I wonder for the pickups if uh, you and McGregor was like, oh shit, like I forgot to put some Alec Guinness in my performance. Like I'm just- <laughs> <laughs> I could do that now. <laughs> I'm just going to be all Alec Guinness and all of these. Uh, Let me front load this. Lightsaber- <laughs> the lightsaber yeah. scene is funny because he's like, I forget how the line, the word clients go, but like he says that. And then like Anakin is like turning around to go in and he like kind of stops him to like say something else. So he's like, oh, wait, I'm going to done it. He's like, I think it's because he says like he wanted her to hide, not to run. But, like, it's just, like, an, an essential, like, kind of, like, piece of information. He's just kind of, like, no, listen to me. Like, you get, we're just going to stand here and go and listen to what I say before we go in there. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, what do we think about that club scene? It's, like. I am literally looking to... at it right now. <laughs> um... I mean, it's obviously supposed to evoke the uh, the cantina scene, like, uh, what with the de-arming of the patron. <laughs> let, let me say this. I, I keep on freeze-framing it, and I just saw. Uh, I know no... what you're freeze-framing on. No, no, there's actually a character. She's wearing Daisy Dukes. Like she just like the the outfit. So the production design of this film is like 50 50. Sometimes like that's actually really good Star Wars. Sometimes uh, it's just a coffee kettle in a diner, like on a counter, like no, like, or or regular chairs from like like a like a vintage store. Like it's it's wild. Yeah, no, there was, was just literally like an IKEA chair in like uh, Padme's yeah. apartment. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's really like. Sometimes it's amazing, and sometimes like we just need a chair here right now that looks futuristic. But in that club. Because it's shot in what I call the prequel style, um, it's these really wide shots where everyone's kind of standing in a green screen space and there's not no density on the top and bottom of the frame in a lot of a lot of shots. You know, they, they try to block it in a way that builds builds it, but um, there's no there's no like fog in there because I don't think the fog would work like a fog machine would work well with the camera. And that's part of the issue. Uh, that's my guess. But the outfits in that club are just regular like jackets with extra pads on them. Like it's really not as exciting as the cantina. So I would say not great. <laughs> like overall, <laughs> uh, pulls me it's out. Also, um, you know, I'm of two minds of this uh, because there's a star Wars YouTuber who complained in the last episode of Andor that like, you could see a wall was made of like bricks and everyone was like, you fucking moron. Like it's a brick. This guy's got cargo um, pants. <laughs> this guy's got cargo pants. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but like he uh, so so I hate to give this guy credit because I don't like him particularly much. But while I think in that instance he was he was wrong, I think broadly what he was saying was right. Like there's this weird invisible line of when something feels Star Warsy versus when it feels something a little too mm. a little too Earth like, and I feel like mm. this movie out of all of them has the most examples of falling on the wrong side of that line. And I think it has something to do with um, all of the domesticity in this. It's like, yeah, lots of like family homes, lots of like personal spaces, like in um, Padme's apartment, uh, the bedroom, like you were talking about, it's like, 
uh, the bed looks like a, a bed you could get in Ikea. And it just like really pulls me out. It's like, oh, it's like they sleep in beds, I guess. And it's like, well, <laughs> it's like, I mean, yeah, of course they sleep in beds. Sure. But like the line that these movies have to ride is like, you're not ever supposed to be thinking about the kinds of beds that they're sleeping in. Yeah. You know, like, which I think is the point in like, just like having a more or less regular looking one it's not like a crazy space bed because like th that would also pull you out of it true uh but there's this thing that the original trilogy does really well where you know like the production design because like there is like a dinner scene in a new hope there is a kitchen in a new hope but for some reason like none of the stuff like none of their utensils or anything or their like kitchen yeah. mixers or whatever like really stand out is like either too spacey or too real and it's more like, like the people in this universe like don't have the same th quite the same like thought patterns of the set like we wouldn't think like it's just weird that they would think it's just like what do they have like MDF wood like what <laughs> this like, is the diner I don't, problem. Like, <laughs> diner has bar has diner yeah. tools and it looks like a diner retro, problem. It looks like a yeah. retro diner and like it really should look more like a cantina. It should be more utilitarian by far. It has and even even the waitress looks like she's a regular American diner waitress it's like her outfit and i just think it really like i know that a lot of complaints and i think uh, hal cut a lot of the diner down started later when um, obi-wan's already sitting in the booth um it really yeah it really does not fit star wars now the idea of going to a diner is great um i think it's better in the truck stop and space balls um <laughs> and and um it, it doesn't fit i will i will backtrack though uh, I did say that the person was wearing cargo pants, and I just think it was knee pads that looked like cargo pants because Boba Fett has car cargo pants. So Star Wars. It was very big of you to, to correct yourself. Star <laughs> Star Wars has pants and pockets and pouches, and that's just the way it's got to be. You got a lot of space stuff put in, in your pants. <laughs> All my space. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah like i'm glad you hit upon the diner thing i'm with you like i like the idea it's of great. him going yeah. to a diner i even like the idea the larger idea that obi-wan is like friends with this like random short order chef from this <laughs> this like seedy <laughs> right whatever it's just like it's just really in the execution and again like i get that he's clearly going for a like a very heavy american graffiti homage here uh, the same with the speeder. The yellow speeder is like uh, well, uh, Naboo you know, Starfighter, from... yellow speeder. Like, okay, we got oh, it. Yeah, it yeah we got it here. Never. Yeah. Almost, almost a little bit overkill. No, but... Let's get back to gray. Let's get back to gray, please. Yeah, I mean, it's this weird thing. It's like, why is one thing Star Wars and another thing sort of feels like not Star Wars? And it's, it's tricky. I try not to fault the movie too much for those things because it is a very tricky moving target. It's like sometimes, you know, things are acceptable and, and sometimes they're not. And you just can't really explain why. And if you like had to scrutinize every single thing for that, you'd probably never make the movie. Um but yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon. And again, I think this movie has the most examples of like, you know, you don't want to think about how these people eat. You don't want to think about right. how they sleep. You don't want to think about how they go to the bathroom. I yeah. mean, that's just... Or do you want to think about them buying something from us or like ordering something from a store, which it looks like they did with the furniture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like so much of the illusion of these movies work because you're not asking the wrong questions. You're not thinking too much about it. You're just going with it. You assume that it works somehow and that's enough. Yeah, they have a system that's like a little bit different than our, like, you know what that is, but like, I don't think it involves them like ordering things from a website or like a catalog or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we talked about the love story. We talked about the noir vibe, but uh, we didn't talk about the titular clones and like the core of this whole mystery is the creation of these clones. Like, what do we think about this plot line? I guess overall, I'll say this. Well, I'll say this when Yoda says, uh, the uh, the Clone War has begun. I'm like, uh. <laughs> it's like saying, saying the movie's title uh, in the movie. Uh, Yoda does it in this one. <laughs> you know, it's like Except it's not even the movie's title, though. It's, it's close enough. It's close enough. It's like, oh, yeah, we, we get it. The Clone Wars, it's like, like they're, they're happening now. It's it's a war with I'm clones. Right now, that's a name. We're sticking to that. Does that does that infer <laughs> that that uh, that droids are all clones? If it's a war between clones, is it is it some sort of like yeah, meta, meta just, narrative yeah. on droids as well? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think all droids are like a kind of clone. 
Yeah. I, I think Camino looks really cool. I will say that. So those creatures, which I also felt were very non Star Wars at first, um, I just think they're different. Also, they're like outer rim, I think they yeah. say. So I kind of accept like, yeah, they're they're definitely they're out there. Um, they kind of yeah. remind me of um, uh, Steven Spielberg's AI, right? Oh, yeah, on those aliens, yeah, yeah a little, yeah. little, little bit of that. I don't think that those are, that those are aliens in AI. I think that they're like robots, robot aliens. <laughs> but it's it's a <laughs> long, elongated yeah. thing, and like it, maybe even yeah. the speech pattern. I haven't seen AI in forever, um, but I like how clean it is, and and it kind of um, the medical sterility of it. Um, and it, you know, it's a post matrix world already. So like we've already seen humans grown in vats and like kind of like robot, like, mm. spot, like tower type things. Um, but I thought it, I thought it worked for me. Like it was, and, and the fact that Obi-Wan's walking in a set and he has no idea what he's, what is going on. He's kind of faking his way through. And I feel like we've all been in those situations where like, I have no idea what's going on, but I have to pretend that I know <laughs> what's going on. And, and watching him kind of play in that space is very interesting because uh, he also has no idea. So the mystery is shared. Uh, with Obi-Wan and we kind of identify with him. I'm like, I'm enjoying watching him uh, like be confused. And I just felt like, yeah, that's that, that works for me. To yeah. Connect that with is the a character. good point. I do think, yeah, I, I think it does a, a the Camino ones fit like best aesthetically with overall of like the prequels and like this movie in particular, like I think that I feel like Camino is like when that most works, like the way this mm. movie looks overall. And uh, yeah. And I think it does, it does work. They look a little bit different than everybody else because they're, they're isolated. So it makes sense. It would be this race. that looks a little bit different than anything else you've ever seen, like in this universe. Um, so one thing that I think we forget now, uh, but at the time it was kind of a cool twist that the clones of the title are actually the good guys, but they're actually the bad guys because they look like stormtroopers, so you sort of see the seeds of the future are being planted. You just reminded me as well yeah. uh, that uh, the the, um, the Kaminoanians um, they have these kind of like head fins, and you actually see a fin, a center fin on the stormtrooper uh, helmet. Uh, so, th- so that, they're actually kind of transposing their own aesthetic principles onto this like warrior uh, armor. And I thought that was interesting because I didn't notice yeah. that until this watch. I'm like, oh, they're they're kind of I don't know getting their their style out there. Like, yeah, I don't know if it's, it says it in this movie, but I was like looking at their Wikipedia page at one point, and like apparently they reach like maturity by age 11, which is also basically what they imparted on the clones. Huh. So yeah, it is oh, really? for them. Yeah. The Kaminoans they reach yeah. maturity by 11. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, like I mean, it makes sense if you think about it. It's like if you're growing clones, the faster they can be ready, the better. One thing that I think um, really hit me differently on this view in 2023 is, um, you know, going back to that scene in the diner where Dexter is helping identify the origins of the dart that Obi Wan has, and that's what sends him off to know to go to Camino and. Um, there's a deleted scene where the reason that Obi-Wan goes to Dex in the first place is because he went to the analysis droids in the Jedi archives and they didn't know what it was. And, you know, there's this whole idea running through this movie and through all the movies actually about how like clones are superior to droids because they have minds and they can think. And I think Obi-Wan has a line. He's like, if droids could think, none of us would be here, would we? And it's just interesting with all the discourse going on right now with like the AI and artificial intelligence. I'm not sure that that line really holds up in 2023. I mean, I hope it does. This whole idea that clones think creatively, so they're superior to droids, which like rely on like centralized construction data, data, structure data set, or whatever. database. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. Centralized data set. Uh, that sounds better than what I was going to say. Um, I don't know. What do you think about that? Like this whole idea is like the reason why we need clones is because they are superior in terms of creative thinking and problem solving than droids and machines. I mean, that's like what a lot of the plot of this movie hinges on. I think it might be cheaper to grow clones than um, to harvest uh, raw material metals to make uh, droids possibly. I mean, it's like, yeah, you're just growing it and giving it some like some gruel juice in a tube. Like maybe it's maybe it's a, a more cost effective. And the idea that the creative element of um, the brain is just kind of like, eh, sure, why not? Uh, it might just be a cost maneuver, I think. I don't know. No, but that's not what the movie is saying, though. Like, the movie is explicitly saying that, like... Oh, I know what the movie is saying. Clones... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I just think that's crazy. 
I, I don't know. Oh, I, no, I mean, I'm asking you about that idea. I, I, I guess I just dismiss, I dismiss the idea that like clones are a good idea for like mass warfare. Like I never, right. I, I just, I see it being problematic, but I guess they, they've changed the brain chemistry uh, enough where uh, they're more, they're more uh, like submissive in certain ways uh, like to be, to act as some sort of like a, like a beta, a beta follower. I don't know. I, and I know there's different like leadership levels too in, in, in the clone. So it's weird. They're yeah. making them more robot like or AI like AI like they're programming. Uh, but them. then they're like, they're, but they're saying that the benefit is the uh, benefit of like creative human mind. But you have but to feed them. Theoretically removing that. Like they're, that's, that's not like a clone. The, and the way they're doing it is not like the best way to go about getting a creative mind. <laughs> yeah, mm, it's true. Well, well, I mean, look, I mean, I feel like R two D two had a lot of creative ideas in his in his uh, in, on his missions. Like, I don't know, I feel like he was pretty much a free thinking droid, as far as I could tell. So I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, well, I think those two cases of R two and three PO are like the outlier special cases. I think like the argument would be that. So there are a couple things in play here. One reading is that you know, which I think is supported by the text of the films themselves, is that what everyone says about droids is actually not true. Like, the dirty secret about droids in Star Wars is that they are sentient and can think, and they're actually like a slave race. And the thing we see again and again is human, I mean, or I guess like organic life constantly reiterating over and over about how droids are just machines and they can't think so that they can continue to treat them like shit. Yeah. Right. I think that was the, the C plot of Solo. Yeah. Yeah. Which is one of and, my and the Boba Fett parts show. of they Solo. Can kind of gets there at one point was it the boba fett show i feel like they kind of get into that <laughs> I, I blacked out most of that show from my memory so i i, I couldn't tell you <laughs> no i mean i just think it's an interesting thing it's like you know you don't really think of star wars as you know talking about the nature of life and sentience and the nature of intelligence and all that but that's really central it's, to, it's, it's what it's all uh, about i mean the force the the, the binding and uh and then the droids also have re restraining bolts. They're they're actually they have inhibitors right. put on them. So it's like, why would you need to inhibit them if they are doing what they're supposed to be? You know, it's like there there's something else there. It's it's really like under the surface. And I, I think that's yeah, that's some old Star Wars. That's some good stuff right there. So well it's really interesting too, because like so they're making these droids and they're pretending that they are, you know, not as alive as they seem to be and with the clones they're trying to make them more like robot like right i have to imagine that there's something along the lines like some economic reason like you were alluding to russ like why creating clones is like more favorable than like i mean like you were saying the you know mining the raw materials and creating all the droids because like you're really asking for it's like think about the discourse about ai artificial intelligence like the nascent version of it that we're experiencing right now and all of the moral questions that arise but like when you create a whole race of people for the explicit purpose of fighting and dying in war like that seems like a much thornier moral can of worms that you've opened up for yourself. Well, that, well, that's that's Blade Runner. That's the replicants. They're built for for off-world mining and for for battle. It's like it's like yeah, th this could get, potentially go there. But I was thinking too, though, they're feeding all those Boba Fets, you know, and they're, they're all they're all you know they're all eating. They're in like the cafeteria. That's not cheap. Like uh, they're probably eating a lot. Yeah. But but I was thinking about this. Like if you if you bro blow a droid's leg off, like it can still crawl around and stuff. I think it's the like the human like determination, like will to survive that would give you an advantage in the field of war. Like if you were to shoot at them, it's like uh, like the teamwork. I think t the teamwork aspects more so than with droids. Um, I, I think there's a certain component of, of of that kind of humanity that would give them an advantage that would make it worthwhile feeding them all and and growing them in the first yeah. place but how much is that there with their like genetically engineered brains like also fair I guess that's yeah. there yeah <laughs> yeah I, I, I couldn't tell you <laughs> you know what you just made me realize they're probably eating on camino's fish 
all fi- it's all fish all time and it's and it's it's probably it's sushi. yeah it's, it's all sushi and probably some sort of like uh, real good sushi on camino that's another tip <laughs> that he got from dexter wildly oh, fresh while you're on camino you should you should get some sushi while you're on camino it's really fresh um. <laughs> it, it's, it's all but you know what also bums me out the fact that we've had mon calmari in in star wars we have all the akbars mm. and we never like they didn't want to do it for phantom menace we never got to really see them. I know people are like that must be delicious, but but there's like you're on Camino and like what's under there? There's got to be wild like creatures under the water too. So, uh, and we never get to. They never explore the ones they've already established are water based creatures, and it kind of bums me out. But Camino itself is really cool, and and a fight in the rain also. I want to mention, uh, you know, J- Jango. Yeah, Fett. that's a cool fight sequence. That's yeah. a cool fight yeah. sequence. Like that. That actually has a physicality that I think, you know, you don't really get a lot in Star Wars. Like, at one point, you know, they go hand-to-hand, and I think that's pretty cool. It's, like, it's pretty cool to see, like, a Jedi and a Mandalorian duking it out in the rain. I think that's I think that's a pretty successful sequence. Let me ask you this, though. Uh, it's established that Beskar later on in, in current iterations of Star Wars can deflect, like, a lightsaber blade or a blaster, but I don't think that that concept existed in Attack of the Clones. I don't think he used like his gauntlets or his armor to deflect um, a lightsaber potentially or 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 blasts. So, because uh, like a Mandalorian yeah, would be so. perfectly equipped to battle a Jedi wearing the most defensive armor to stop any of their attacks. So, but it also shows that Obi Wan, as powerful as he might be, is not really super. Power- He's not like you know pulling things and throwing them. I feel like Jedi like are easily beaten in this in this film, like in in the in battle. Uh, it just shows that they're kind of not the most amazing warrior that I would have assumed that they'd be like unbeatable. Like you have a, you have a, 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 a phalanx of, uh, of Jedi, like you can't beat that. And they almost get beat. So I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I think what happens is like the thing with the droids. And I mean, arguably this happens a couple of times, you know, it's just sheer numbers. It's like Jedi can be overwhelmed if you just like throw hundreds yeah. and hundreds and thousands and thousands of droids at them. I mean, like, you know, which is true. And arguably the same thing happens in the next movie. Um, it's in Mace Windu, it was, I'm maybe more smart the line. Did you say like, we're not warriors? We're Yeah, we're keep- keepers of the peace, not soldiers. Right. Soldiers, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, like, does this idea come off or is it like more of an intellectual idea? You know, the Jedi can't fight because they're not an army, can't use droids because they're susceptible to. So, I mean, in the first movie, so I should give George Lucas credit. The first movie makes the case for why droids are ineffective, because all you have to do is blow up the control ship and then they all shut off. So I think, you know, having successfully demonstrated the weakness that creates the justification for for clones um what do we think about i'm a little confused about like so this whole thing is that somebody secretly ordered the clone army 10 years earlier which just so happens to be the amount of time that has passed between episode one and episode two so are we supposed to infer that Darth Sidious's plan to, I don't really know what his, his plan was actually, but like his plans were foiled or they weren't foiled in episode one. His ultimate long game was to create this war under false pretenses in order to establish his power. So he he ordered the clone army secretly. That was my assumption. He, he, ordered, he preemptively ordered the army to be ready for when he would need um, a force to go up against the Trade Federation armies, uh, yeah, exactly. To to allow um, Emergency War Powers Act uh, to give him you yeah. know, full full control. Or, I think what it says show tells of the Jedi. Um, did you watch any of that? I did not. No, because there is. I haven't seen it either. But there is apparently that specific of that are, are answered in that episode of that show. Hmm. And it's oh, like well, that, ha- huh. Count Dooku is the one that orders it, but obviously through like under. But specifically, he's like technically he's the one that ordered ordered. Uh... Yeah, well, so I know what really happened. So they say Jedi Master Sifo Dyas, right, is the one who ordered the clone army, and then they say in the movie he died ten years ago. So it either wasn't him or it like was him, but he's conveniently dead. So like, who's it really for? Originally, the clones were to have been ordered from Sido Dyas, right, which is clearly Darth Sidious. But then they realized that that's maybe too on the nose, but they had to come up with a name that they could ADR to fit in the mouth that was saying Sido Dias. So they said Sifo Dias, which seems like a 
It's like, I don't know. It's like, I would almost rather it happen uh, Saito Diaz because, well, I'm sure there is an explanation in some of the expanded universe media. It's like, I really feel like it's got to make sense in the context of the yeah. movie itself. And, and also, sort of like, the this the thing that was in that episode was going to be addressed in Revenge of the Sith originally. And uh, Lucas decided that that was extraneous to what was going on. Decided to leave that a mystery until this episode came along. Yeah, so it's sort of weird. It's like, the other thing that's a little unclear to me is exactly why the separatists are a thing like why are people leaving why are star systems leaving the republic like what is their whole like what is this conflict about that sidious is creating taxation like i don't really (laughs) it's like a weird meta thing going on right because like it's supposed to be the reason they're leaving is because according to count dooku isn't like it's because the dark side is taking over the senate but like he's the one that's kind of actually like uh embroiled in the dark side but like he's somehow got it backwards well, that's another <laughs> level of it also because like at some point so so that scene which is a good scene i think uh between dooku and obi-wan where he's interrogating him dooku played by the incredible christopher lee who um you know he has this really great scene that i think is supposed to mirror the scene in empire strikes back where vader asks luke to join him and together they can overthrow the emperor um dooku basically tells obi-wan exactly what's going on he tells him the truth you know what if i told you the republic was under the control of a dark lord of the sith his name is darth sidious and he's controlling everything he's he's orchestrating this entire thing and obi-wan's like no i don't believe you my question is what is dooku actually doing there like, do you think that's a genuine? Yeah, a I feel like he's offer he's making him. Yeah, I think because we don't know I've... Dooku well enough, uh, it's really it, it is hard to say. Like when you watch it the first time, like why, why would you just tell him that? But I think I feel like he's just been duped. <laughs> like, and he thinks he's like kind of in some ways like earnest in like what he's trying to do. Well, I think he believes that he can get Obi Wan. I think he believes that he <laughs> might actually go with him for whatever reason. Maybe his own ego. I don't know. Well, I think because. You know, I think you're right. I think he is genuine in that moment, which like makes the later villainy a little bit harder to take. But yeah, I mean, the reason why I think we're supposed to kind of be like, maybe this Count Dooku guy is like, maybe there's more to him than meets the eye. It's like, on the one hand, like we know what he's saying is true. And on the other hand, they do this shortcut of making him Qui-Gon's former master. So we're like, oh, okay, like we liked Qui Gon, and this was Qui Gon's teacher. So it's it's sort of like a shortcut to familiarity. I feel like, you know, if you were a novelist and you were writing this, once you got to episode two, you created Count Dooku. You would go back and revise episode one and have Dooku be on the Jedi Council, so you would have a connection and understand the significance. Like the idea that Count Dooku was once a Jedi and that he left the order is clearly a big deal to the other Jedi in this movie, but not to the audience. So I think by giving him that connection to Qui-Gon, that's sort of the like way to kind of to kind of paper over that. But I'm not sure that it works. What do you think? No. I feel like it, it vaguely I don't know if it I like it in a vague way and I don't know if it like when he kind of doesn't like really hold up the scrutiny maybe but like it kind of mirrors away I think like a lot of like modern politics work where there's like a lot of pitting against to create the chaos like and I think that's kind of what City of is, is doing with Dooku like I don't know if he realizes that like he that he is like really like super super on the dark side <laughs> like yeah and he, and he think that that he's actually trying to combat corruption yeah well so and again i haven't read any of the ancillary media so so i'm sure that you know what we're hitting upon here is probably if i were to guess where they go with the character is like he's sort of this like tragic figure who like who turns to the dark side the dark side who turns to the dark <laughs> side but um but like not not all the way he's like you know 75 percent of the way where like the motivation for doing so is is to actually you know join them to fight them or whatever yeah uh, you know maybe potentially the, um, in his mind do you think he calls it a, the dooku side <laughs> <laughs> i i hope he does um so but in terms of the separatists themselves i think their motivation is well i think there are several motivations that are are offered by the movie one of which is this like vague notion of corruption of the senate 
which like I don't quite know what that actually translates to in terms of like what that actually is or what that actually means effectively. Um, but in that meeting that Dooku has with the leaders of the Separatists, they all seem to be like the titans of industry or whatever. True. Which include <laughs> the new gun rays from the Trade Federation from episode one. So what I actually think it is, I think it's like the private corporations of the galaxy that are sick of having to follow the laws and rules of the republic the bureaucracy who just basically want to be free to make as much money however they want to make it without having to follow quote-unquote rules tax yes taxes but i don't think that's what dooku is. yes taxes it's it the taxes, taxes. <laughs> it's like we don't want to pay this but i think that dooku probably has a different idea in mind but that's like actually what's happening right i think so, like so, all the, i think all this chaos is like part of the point like all the or just yeah kind of, right kind of, yeah Right. So Dooku, so if we buy his motivation as genuine, he's using the separatist leaders like the banking clan guy and the techno union guy. It's like he's using their money and their resources and their droid army to kind of fight the Republic that he knows is under the control of a Dark Lord of the Sith. So he's using them, not realizing he himself is being used. Yeah. Yes. That's sort of what's yeah. going on here. Yeah. Yeah. A, lot, a big ruse. So, so clearly that stuff is there because we were just able to to tease that out. But I have to ask, and I kind of said the same thing on the Phantom Menace pod. It's like, it's like, is that clear enough? Or was I just too young to understand that that's what was going on? I'm not sure it, it like really comes off in the movie. But then once you watch it, it's like, oh, he says, the guy literally says, I'm a banker. <laughs> and like the other guy, he's like, I'm the factory owner. I mean, basically, is what they're saying. So it's like, I don't know how much more it's obvious he like can a, be about it. like a political it. cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> I think, like, it's not clear enough in the sense that, like, that's the idea that I vaguely got, but I, like, was trying to figure it out kind of like we're doing now, and I didn't even really get to, like, a concrete answer. If I'm like, wait, do I do I have that right? Like, do I? I just don't understand if I, like, that's kind of the uh, general idea that I got from it but like i it wasn't clear enough that i was assured that i was right about it <laughs> so maybe it isn't clear enough you know what i am clear about though when dooku hops on that little speeder and it looks ridiculous flying through the desert air without it without a, a face mask <laughs> like all that air rushing it i i don't know he just he looks so so static on that thing i'm like oh, that is yeah ridiculous. i like how he just moves across like downward on the screen <laughs> this like, like it's drops just like, yeah it's almost like there's, there's no foreshortening your <laughs> perspective it's just yeah. <laughs> but yeah i think I, I i do to go back i do agree if, if we knew more about dooku if he, i really think he had to be on that council because his turn would actually have weight and therefore and the only thing that's a little strange is asking obi-wan to join him it's a little bit strange because you don't know enough about dooku to know where he actually stands you don't know enough of his background you don't know his, his his loyalties and so it really doesn't work vader you know in empire you start to there, there's just some push pulls like no there's good in you that there's there's a chance that no he could turn vader and that the together they they could take on the emperor that you could believe because there's enough established but dooku it doesn't work for it's it's too forced and i i didn't care for it yeah but i don't think any of that stuff is established though at that point like when when vader says it you're like whoa like what it's like why is he saying this and then the revelation that he's actually luke's father it's like oh well that makes sense but so like he's at, like at the time when he says it yeah i i agree but I still there's still more investment in the character for that for me to even go with it. Sure. Yeah. And and Duke is still too fresh. Although Christopher Lee does play someone I would listen to. It's like, all right, this is this threatening. Yeah. Uh, That's another reason why he cast Christopher Lee. I think, you know, you get someone with the gravitas who like, you know, it's like replacing Darth Maul, who was, I think, one of the more successful aspects of the Phantom Menace, yep. clearly an iconic design. How do you top Darth Maul? I think he did something really smart. He he casts a really good actor who you can't take your eyes off of. Instead, he didn't try to, like, make the new Darth Maul. He was like, no, yeah. I'm just I'm just going to get fucking Dracula to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, too, because I think uh, in Lord of the Rings, as um, as Saruman, uh, he imprisoned uh, Gandalf at the top of the tower, much in the same way, like I think about uh, Obi-Wan floating around, like not being able to move. Like he had, like in that wizard battle, he's like suspended, uh, Gandalf is. So like, <laughs> so he's done this in two, like a space wizard movie and then a Middle Earth wizard movie. Like it's, it's <laughs> like classic uh, Christopher Lee. He's just like, hey, we need you to suspend uh, a hero in, 
with magic. <laughs> we and... got a suspension scene for you. He's like, done. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> in, in a rock tower. <laughs> Well, that's actually an interesting point. He plays very similar characters in both these movies. Do you think, I mean, I don't know this, but do you think that casting was just coincidental? Or do you think that it had something to do with knowing that he had been cast as Saruman in Lord of the Rings? I mean, similar with like the design similarities that you were pointing out, Russ, with the Matrix. It's like, it's like it's sort of inescapable. Like the connections are so strong. I, 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 maybe it just has to do with Christopher Lee, just kind of like what he can pull off. Um, yeah. yeah. By yeah. being like, like by being like, cause he's not like a big bad in either case, but he's like, just kind of has grabbed. He's like a compromised yeah. man. He's like, a, yeah. <laughs> he's, like, he's like not I mean, quite. That's something enough. that like, you probably need a good actor. Not for, be bad. Like, a, a very yeah, tall, yeah. good actor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it kind of makes me sad because the scene between you and McGregor and Christopher Lee is like is like one of the better scenes in the movie. It's two really good actors who were playing a scene together, and it's like you almost wish that there was more of that. Yeah. I love when he's like, like, well, you know, he's like, well, it better be soon. <laughs> well, well, I have also, work to do. <laughs> that actually reminds me. I want to bring up that, um, like, uh, I I didn't ever say his name right, but Ian Mc Ian McDiarmid D- Dearmond? Ian Mc- McDiarmid? McDiarmid. I think, yeah, I think uh, uh, McDiarmid, I think, yeah. He is so captivating to watch speak, to watch sit in a room, to talk to a room with people in a green screen. It doesn't matter. Like, he elevates every scene he's in. Uh, it, he is so good and, and p- like, projects so much in even the, the smallest bits of dialogue. Uh, I'm just, like, he's carrying so much of it for me. Um, Ian McGregor... Uh, Ian McDiarmid, uh, like they're they're for me they're doing so much heavy lifting. Christopher Lee in this, um, they're really like well, in this watch. I'm like he's so good. He's excellent. <laughs> like I'm just like I like more of him. I wanted more scenes with him and Anakin. I wanted to see that relationship. You know, I believe that there's something there's there there were sparks of it. And like he's like you know he's telling him he's like you could be the greatest Jedi that ever. Like it's just it's amazing. Like that to me is. Is why like those little moments are what I what I love about uh, this movie now that I guess I didn't appreciate enough at the time. No, I mean Ian McDermott is is definitely you know an unsung hero of this whole of this whole trilogy. Like we overlook it because he is so good and he makes it look so easy. But like he's 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 really he makes this character work. And, you know, it's a tricky character because he's kind of playing two characters. And, you know, one of them is like a very two dimensional, you know, what you see is what you get kind of scenery chewing villain um, who's like, you know, motivation is kind of amorphous beyond like unlimited power. (laughs) And um, like he really he sells it. He he sells every scene he's in, which leads me to a question that I just thought of. But. This is something that has crossed my mind before. Um, should Anakin have a British accent? And if he did, would that have sold some of the dialogue more? I'm being yeah, serious. Yeah, no, I think I would have. Right? Because I think that's like, yeah. Because I, that's why I don't think, what, especially once you get rid of like all the whiny stuff, like that hitting Chris's performance is that bad. Because I think, because that's like what I feel like that's they're going for. It's just it's this kind of like stiff upper lip, kind of like stoic um somebody who would speak like in a wooden way like this even when he's like like grappling with his emotions <laughs> yeah i mean there's just something really i think objectively like i don't think it's the vantage point of an american who speaks with an american accent who like inherently thinks like a british accent is like something serious and exotic but it's sort of like there is something to the sound of when dialogue is spoken with an accent with a British accent, that sounds more, you know, commanding. Like you just, I think you would buy the dialogue that doesn't sound natural when it's said with like an American, like neutral accent or whatever, like a, I mean, or a Canadian yeah. accent in this case, I guess in the case of Amy Christensen, I think it would work a lot better. Like even as written, like he could say some of those same lines and I think it would work better. Yeah. And I don't, I just kind of feel, even though he's like not royalty or like a royal character, like he's like supposed to be almost like the opposite of that, like because he's a Jedi, like, and he has like all these scenes with Padme, like I just, it to me seems like kind of like a royal love story. Yeah. Um, 
What do we think of the arena battle, the end? I mean, or like the whole action sequence at the end, like with the arena and all the Jedi and then like all the Clone War stuff and all hell breaks loose. One of the best lines in the film, uh, Obi-Wan's good job, you know, like uh, we're here to rescue you. Uh, I thought that was a defining moment of the entire film. I was like, that is the best delivery, a whole film maybe for like a shortest line. Um, so that I love. Yeah, that's a great moment for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I think everyone everyone would probably agree, like even seeing it for the first time, I think that's about the only thing maybe I remember about my experience was being excited to see an entire um, screen of Jedi fighting together at the same time because no one had ever seen it. It was the big talked about point, like no one's ever seen Jedi in their prime fighting together. And it's like, all right, well, it's, it's pretty cool, I guess. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was, I guess that's as good as we're going to get. I do love, though... Um, uh, Samuel Jackson's Mace Windu introduction into that sequence in the, in the HAL 9000 cut in particular. Uh, it's very much one of the best like entrances in the, in any of the star Wars movies and great first character. So I just kind of uh, hello with a lightsaber ignition. So I don't know. That's um, that was good overall. I think the CG works for me in that sequence because of the dust. So I have this thing I call the Jumanji effect. It's not the first time it happened. <laughs> it happened in uh, Jurassic Park uh, when we get the stampede of dinosaurs. For whatever reason, the CG contrast doesn't match the film contrast, and it's really noticeable in a uh, non in like human man-made uh, environments. So uh, the monkeys in the house in Jumanji really stand out, and the contrast doesn't work, or the rhino in the street. Uh, and then uh, in Geonosis, it actually works because there's so much dust and natural light that the low contrast actually is okay for me. And I think the CGI looks the best here than it does in the rest of the film. Anakin riding yeah. that, that weird animal on that Naboo that looks look terrible. This, this sequence looks good and dusty and it works for me. So overall, I generally like the look of it and I think the action plays out all right. The chariot thing. And also, eh. <laughs> this is like some of the creature design that I was alluding to before that mm. I like because it's like really like this weird expression. It's like they have these like these like nightmare creatures with like giant like yeah. uh, like teeth that like this time I'm like that's pretty insane looking like especially, especially for them like, yeah like that would be terrifying to be in there with these things yeah I like those <laughs> it's kind of like like a take on on like like on the rancor face but like in like a full body where they can now add more movement like they couldn't have done with the rancor. And I thought, I thought, yeah, this is, this is pretty cool. Like they're, you know, they're fighting monsters. They're fighting those, uh, those little, what were they like? Kind of like Wattos? Like what are, what are those things? Little, little, little bug guys. <laughs> oh yeah. They're like, yeah. They're, Watto. <laughs> they're like Watto soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> the Geonosians? Yeah. Like the insect guys? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what are those like globular projectile sonic blaster things that they shoot them with? Just, just give them lasers. <laughs> just give them lasers. <laughs> give everyone laser guns. I don't know what we're doing here. <laughs> we all do lasers here. <laughs> this is a laser show. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, what do you think about there was a thing in um, the asteroid chase uh, with that like sonic mine thing, which I think is a weird idea for space because like, you know, one of the things about space is that there is no sound <laughs> in space because there's no medium for the sound waves to travel through. So like a sound based weapon in space is like the one place where that could never work. <laughs> well, Unforced error. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Without the air, mo yeah. <laughs> without the air molecules, all you really have is like um, radio waves that can be transmitted. That's it. Yeah. I mean, there's like no medium to conduct the like sonicness of it now now is this also mirroring empire with it with the asteroid field like are, are we doing this again like like is this another mirroring uh situation yeah i mean i don't know like i don't know how much of the mirroring is intentional some of it is certainly um the extent to which you know you have another asteroid field chasing being chased by the same ship with a similar character, a similarly dressed character, <laughs> and and Obi Wan does the same maneuver where he loses him uh, by that, hiding behind that, the thing. That, I think that was a potential because I read somewhere that George Lucas like that provides facts that that explains how Boba Fett knows uh, to look for that in Empire Strikes Back because he saw that already. That's, that's, that's intentional. That's <laughs> that's so wild to me. <laughs> that level. Of, I all right. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> but I was uh, reminded when we were talking about the CG creatures before the Watto, the scene with Watto. Like I feel like that 
at least up to that point, was like the best performance of a CGI character because I feel like Wado is so sad in that scene. <laughs> like when he's like recognizes Ed, like <laughs> Annie. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a sad Annie, old man. Little Annie. <laughs> like it almost brings a tear to my eye. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so we didn't talk about that when Anakin goes back to Tatooine to save his mother and fails and then slaughters an entire tribe of like sentient people. Like, what do we think about, what do we think about, um, uh, I mean, there's a lot to tease out there, but so, um, what do we think about the whole thing about his mother having to save his mother and then his reaction to it? I always wondered it would be better if he found her just dead already. Like, Mm -hmm. um, and he didn't even have the, he didn't even have that final moment with her. Yeah. And like maybe that would you would understand a little bit more like what he's doing and also just kind of understand his overall like he's just becoming more and more pessimistic in general like because that is at least something that he got to see his mother last one last time i guess he doesn't choose not to like see it that way but i mean could you do it though where the mother was already dead because then like the the trip is sort of anticlimactic it's sort of like then what happens there it's like what yeah, happens. I mean, on? it would just be a very, I guess it's not a very Star Wars moment, but it would be a very bleak moment. <laughs> like, you just kind of like, I don't know, like you would, I don't know, maybe you would see her lifeless body from behind or something. But like, so you're saying like, like he, he sees a body. Still... He sees a body. He sees her dead oh, body. Oh, he sees the body. Like, yeah. if the, oh, okay. If there was, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. If there was a charred yeah. body, though, that would actually fit in line with, you know, the, uh, the, with the New Hope. Yeah, New Hope 77. So it's like, that that would work, but I guess I don't know. I, I do agree. If, if she if she had already passed and he found her and was too late to save her, and that's the problem. But if he's too late entirely, I think that'd be worse. I do agree. I think that would be worse for him, not having any sense well, of closure. Like, but after all these years, like he does see her body, but it's dead. <laughs> yeah. Well, so here's the interesting thing too. Like, like I feel like you know what was stopping him this whole time from going back there sooner. Like, I don't understand Jedi Order, right? So you know what's interesting is that he doesn't really blame the Jedi for that. It's a cult. It's like you would <laughs> no, but like I'm saying, it's like it's like you would think he would be mad that I think clearly we're supposed to infer that like the Jedi have kept him away from visiting his mother this whole time. Like, I mean, that's a part of the thing about like no attachment. Da, da, yeah. da, da, da. But like, you would think when he was just there, if he had only gotten there sooner, you would think that he would express some more anger against the Jedi, like explicitly for having right. prevented him from saving his mother from seeing that would his be, mother because then that, he wouldn't have been. better development. Be very yeah. Keeping, yeah. I mean, and that would be what he would do like that's just what he would be he should be doing because like that's who he is <laughs> yeah and i feel like it's there implicitly yeah. again it like plays into his motivation in the next movie to prevent history from repeating itself with padme um though i mean it's interesting like is it more potent this way because in this version he he really he blames himself he doesn't really blame the jedi at all he blames himself it's a failing of his he should have been strong yeah. he should have been able to do it he should have been able to save her why couldn't i save her he doesn't say anything about like i've been wanting to see my mom for years and the jedi have always been like no 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 you can't and you know fuck them because if i hadn't done what they said earlier then she probably wouldn't be dead so I think that that's interesting that he he turns it into like self-loathing or self-motivation yeah. or whatever. Uh, I do find it a little strange that the whole reason why he's in this situation is because of the Jedi and he uh, he doesn't give voice to that frustration. I don't think ever, not even in the next movie. Well, if you're being generous, I think it's kind of interesting that like, because up to that point, he is like a petulant child and like that is like... That when he decides to take ownership and like maybe he's being too hard on himself, but like he takes owner, like he's just like this is the first time where he's like this is my fault for for mm-hmm. anything. Where yeah, like which is up weird to though, then it would be like Obi Wan sucks, like <laughs> and then like <laughs> now he's just like, yeah. But I that's suck. interesting though. So, but that's interesting though uh, because like the one time where it's actually deserved, he blames himself when that's actually. Yeah the juvenile response is clearly not his fault. He didn't, he didn't. Right. I mean, I don't know. It's interesting. <laughs> um, so what do we think about him murdering all of the, the Tuscans there? That seems a little, uh, seems like a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Seems like a, seems pretty, seems pretty evil. I don't know. I, I think 
he says he does, like like every one of the, like I think the fact like that he he goes and makes sure that everyone is dead like it sounds instead of just like like a rage uh, I don't know I don't know it's it's it's, yeah. it's very um, strategic sounding. Well, yeah, the weirdest he's... part about it is that right after he goes and tells Padme all about it, including that's what, what I was he just said gonna... about how right. it's like it's like that's what's weird, and what's exactly. even weirder. What's even weirder is that, like, the movie seems to think that that's fine. <laughs> yeah. And that, like, also, like, that should be, like, a horror moment, like, where it's just, like, this guy is, this guy is not well. Because, like, 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 he did, like, he spent so much time doing that, and now he's, like, showing some kind of, like, regret over it, but, like, I don't know, like, it's just, like, a weird regret. And that, it's like, said, yeah. Like, he wants it's, her, he, like, it's almost like he, he's, like, he wants her to like help him feel better about it he's talking to a humanitarian like, <laughs> i mean like like of all people yeah. like like she's specifically about saving lives well what this is obviously trying to be is an homage to the searchers i think that's the inspiration for how that whole subplot plays out and how it look complete with like the um you know how Klieg lars is sort of maimed from like from like trying to go out and find her and been like the search parties and stuff like that um and I think similar to how the Phantom Menace is like very accidentally racist by paying homage to movies and tropes from a time that like was racist. I think that this movie is really saying that the Tuscan Raiders are subhuman. So it's OK. It's like it's not real murder. It's like it's not great. Like yeah, It's not it's that bad, though, because like they're not real people. I mean, they're just weird, mindless space people. It's OK. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah it's oh, which funny. is a little uncomfortable. And one of the things I appreciated about the Book of Boba Fett was how it sort of rehabbed the image of the Tusken Raiders from this idea yeah. of like, quote unquote, savages to they're actually the indigenous people of this planet. And like all of these like humans and aliens and everyone here, like they're the colonizers and, and like we're actually on their planet. And so, like, no wonder they're so mad raiding things and stuff. It's because we took over their shit. So they're clearly an analog for, you know, for American indigenous peoples. And it's even, you know, the parallel is is stronger with, you know, invoking the searchers. And it's just really weird that this movie is racist in the same way that the searchers is. Yeah. And I'm wondering if uh, it's which is like, like weird. <laughs> I wonder, like, like, uh, did Lucas, whoever, like. In their mind, it's like, well, because we're depicting somebody falling from grace and going to the dark side, like, but then, like, you're saying, like, this, that's just the way the whole thing is depicted. It's just kind of like, no, well, it's also well, weird it was, then, that, too. Wasn't, that was unpleasant, but oh well. <laughs> no, well, it's also weird then the fact that he says it to Padme, he tells her what she did. Uh, yeah. He tells her what he did, and she, she basically says, hey, we all make mistakes. Don't be too hard yes, on yourself. Right. It's like, yeah. it's like, you know, one of the things that Hal did is he and just cuts that scene out. Yes. And like, we, we saw, I mean, we didn't see it, but we saw this, the beginning of it. Like, we don't need her. Like, she doesn't, he doesn't need to tell her. Yeah, he doesn't need to tell her. So it actually makes it even more effective and horrifying because that means he knows what he did is bad and that he shouldn't tell Padme. Yeah. And then we know what this guy is actually capable of. She doesn't. And, and nobody does, really. Like nobody's right, and nobody nobody's does. nobody's yeah. saw what he did. So you know, once again, like there's a good version of this movie there that exists. I think, you know, the HAL nine thousand cut really makes this movie work, you know, in ways that it really could and should have. Yes. Yeah. Um uh what do so we think about Oh, were you gonna say Sorry, the, go the, the, no, no, no. the droid factory scene? Is that where you uh... Yeah. Okay. But what were you gonna say? Just that how the how cut also just makes that actually like a really good scene, <laughs> or just kind of like a good like solid action scene. Just just the pacing of it that it just kind of flies through for and it feels a lot more propulsive. Yeah, no, it feels more propulsive. And you know, mainly what he cuts are the comedy moments from three PO. Yeah. Um, By the way, like that, I always that I'm so confused. Line, it just feels a little bit like a. Uh, little like just in a 2002 <laughs> like sense like uh that way that like media just casually was like just a little bit transphobic but like <laughs> doesn't it oh really you think that's what yeah that... oh yeah because like because it's just like it doesn't seem it doesn't make sense for him 
to be like it's just like i'm so confused like it seems like a reference to people used to just like say people like call people like sexually confused if they were um oh, that's anything other than straight. i never but I like because like i don't know it's just like it doesn't to me it doesn't like the joke doesn't like play any other way like it just like it's just like why is he saying i'm so confused like i know that because he has his head on another but it's just kind of <laughs> it, there could have been a different line there that would have made more sense like adds a joke so i feel like oh, that is true. kind of I a joke ain't got nobody <laughs> like like there's all yeah. kinds of like <laughs> Well, so you're hitting on something, not the transphobia, which is a really interesting reading of that, that I don't know that I ever read. the. It's just like one of those kind of like 90s, like early 2000s, like kind of casual jokes. Like, (laughs) well, I mean, that's certainly interesting. um, But more broadly, I think one of the things that doesn't really work at all in the theatrical cut is the romance subplot. But the other thing for my money that really doesn't work at all is the humor. And I think it's I think it's on display the most in the droid factory scene and the uh, the arena scene with like the horrible puns that three PO makes about being quite. You're singing my tickets. <laughs> I, I I found it I found it intolerable. So when I when I watched it uh, when I watched the theatrical, I was like, this is <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, it's like it goes out of its way to be cringingly unfunny. He he was binksing. It's almost like rubbing your nose in it. (laughs) I would say the humor in this movie works even less than the humor in The Phantom Menace. Yeah. I would agree. I think part it does because the one thing that I do that I like I still kind of feel this way, but like I liked Phantom Menace a little bit more when it when it came out because just because like i knew that was a bad movie but like just because there was like a little more, more sense of like wonder of like mm. in, in like adventure you know when they were visiting like the gungan uh, underwater cities like scenes like that and i feel like well, alice in wonderland like, dumb humor kind of fantastic of, yeah 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 and like dumb the dumb humor modes kind of like fit a little easier into that kind of tone it really was a, a film for a younger age, I think, uh, especially based yeah. on like, you know, um, uh, young Anakin's age. Like it really was for younger kids, in my opinion. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like the, the early Harry Potter movies, movies versus the later ones. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like when they're <laughs> yeah. The, the tone like ages, ages with them. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Uh, you know, read that way because like the prequels are then ostensibly for somebody younger than the audience of the original Star Wars, yet at the same time had to be for an audience that was decades older than the audience of the original Star Wars. So, so it's sort of like I think you might be onto something there, where it's it's simultaneously trying to be for like really young kids and also for like jaded Gen Xers, right? <laughs> and it's and it's kind of like a it's it's an impossible needle to thread. Isn't that what Doctor Who is doing all the time? That, that's like, like yeah, well, yeah doctor who is like straddling that all the time doing a better job i'm sure <laughs> yeah i mean that's actually a good, kind of a good point yeah it's a good straddler <laughs> <laughs> it's for kids but adults are obsessed um, with it you know yeah i mean it's actually an app comparison um i don't know <laughs> it's sort of tricky like the jokes it's like whenever there's like a joke in this movie it like really pulls me out in a weird way it's almost like they're just like dropped in from the sky and it's like, Oh, you were trying to be funny there. I guess I really, <laughs> I really wish you hadn't tried. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause they I don't know, like man. all have their, their own like kind of shot set up too. Like, it's just like that whole thing was set up just to have these jokes. <laughs> like, and it was so easy to cut that yeah. way. You could cut them right <laughs> out. They were dropping right yeah, in, yeah. take them right back out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean like that's what's so it's like, here, I have to be honest, like when revisiting the theatrical cut of this movie, which I don't do very frequently, because like I said, I usually watch the HAL 9000 version, you know, I'm always like, uh, was it really as bad as I remember? And I'm always like, <laughs> kind of with the movie right up until those stupid lines in the droid factory and the arena from 3PO. It's like, oh, God, like that really is beyond the pale. It's like, yeah, like, who thought that was good? You know what it reminds me of when they're in the droid factory? It reminds me of um, Nick Arcade, where basically you have these, these, Nick it, Arcade. these kids in like a blue screen <laughs> yes, room yeah. and they just like layer on the computer uh the, like the video arcade game on top of that it's like jump jump like push touch like, like An- anakin's like looking like off screen like towards the screen like looking at himself <laughs> like, trying to move. i gotta say though i have complicated feelings about this movie because as much as 
things like that I really have kind of a visceral reaction to and I do not like. I can't hate how weird and idiosyncratic this movie is like there's something charming and like in this day and age like admirable about you know making a movie that is just like so i keep i keep thinking of this line from uh from from ghostbusters like no human being would make movies like this it's almost like (laughs) it's it's almost like uh, you know in this weird moment that we're living in of like franchise media whether it's like superhero films or the coming specter of ai created entertainment or (laughs) uh, you know whatever that's going to turn into it's like it's like no ai would come up with a movie like this no yeah it's pure humanity it's (laughs) it's pure humanity like no no studio no movie made by committee would be as idiosyncratic as this movie is yeah and i can't Part of me loves this movie for that. It's like I can't not. It's 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 the great work of the maestro George Lucas. You really can't. Right. Like he's conducting a symphony of specialists, and uh, I can say that I enjoy this film now, particularly the Hound in a Thousand Cut, and that I watched it and I I I relatively enjoyed myself. I I don't I don't have the same. I guess it's, it wasn't a hatred, but but yeah, I had the Phantom Menace hangover. And I couldn't watch this with with like a, a clear head, and I think this actually continued my 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 not, not even distaste, but I think it my 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 contempt for the prequels uh, into uh, Revenge of the Sith, and and with some given time, I could look at it and say like there's good parts of this, and th- there is a movie that has resurfaced out of it uh, through this this new edit, and I think it's I think it's worth worth the time. I think it's worth the watching. Yeah, I totally agree that and what what Josh said because like you know I me mean? like I just I can't help but love like a funky mu- movie like if it's just like it's, I feel like anything like that is a gift like you know <laughs> in, in its own way like it's amazing it's just, yeah like, it's yeah <laughs> I don't really know what else to say about this movie it's like it transcends good and bad in a way <laughs> it's like yes it, to both of those yeah. things. it's it's, like, it's both at it's once like, yeah. it really is yeah I yeah I. I don't even know what to say about it. Actually, let me ask you: uh, What scene did you think I was freeze framing <laughs> in in the club? Oh, I thought there are like some weird like thong costumes in that. Oh, I totally, scene. I totally uh, freeze frame there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, when, yeah. When they first walk in, which kind of mirrors the Return of the Jedi, uh, Ula, uh, the dancer type of costume. Like, like there was like a slight bit of um sexuality in star wars that was always kind of there that's been kind of i guess lost in the in the prequel films that, that there's just none of yeah like i guess like this is the movie that gets closest to confronting sexuality yeah you know, with this like really you know fumbling virgin teenager who like has a crush virgin crush on Question Padme. Mark? virgins oh Question i don't mark? know yeah. i don't know i mean Padme seems uh, yeah. to have, have you know she she has some she has some stories. Anakin went right from being a kid right to the Jedi Council. He's got a lot of pent up um, curiosity. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I guess here's a crass question: Do you think they had sex in this movie? Oh. Well, I think the Hal cut makes that more clear that they did because like oh yeah the, when they go right to the kiss and I think they go right up to the, the after that too that next morning the morning, morning. The next, next morning yeah, he, he's out he's out stretching like yeah, he's <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. oh yeah. that's t- then, yeah, like post coital like, stretch. The actual cut, like between that, is like when he's having a nightmare, and like it looks like he's in bed alone. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, these movies have a weird relationship with sex and sexuality. It's like you know when it's like clearly a big part of the plot, like depends on making babies. Sex, like yeah, <laughs> making Jedi babies. Yeah, making Jedi. And the way babies, it's implied it's... in the hell cut is like I think it just is very in keeping with like sex and Star Wars. Like it was just like. They kiss, yeah, and I then mean, there's the next morning, and like she comes out with like, their hair down, and she like is like wearing a robe, and he's like standing out there, like, <laughs> like, in full stretch mode. <laughs> <all stretched. laughs> uh, there's something similar in The Empire Strikes Back. Like you have to assume that like Han and Leia had sex on the Falcon, right? Oh, totally. I mean, all that time in the asteroid field and <laughs> that long I just... trip to Bespin. Oh yeah, and then and then, like, and then they're getting sauced at Best Bin. I just I just got a flash of like what their sex would be like. Yeah, it would be pretty intense. <laughs> 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 a 
Wait, wait, who, wait, who's sex? Uh, Han and Leia. Han and Leia. Yeah, yeah a lot of lip biting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of pointing, a lot of <laughs> <hard> fingering. <laughs> oh god, it's too late. It's late. Um, <laughs> uh, do we have any thoughts that you guys wanted to say that haven't said? And if so, uh, what are they? Oh, and then we'll move on to closing thoughts. Just like I was looking at some of the, I guess people that were almost cast as Anakin. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Colin Hanks that. was one that was uh like, like and I, I was trying to look it up like and i guess there was something to it because there was like a post from like 2000 on the force on net where like i guess he was like reliable word that like he was like being considered and then there was an art or uh interview with him from the time where he didn't say that he was like he auditioned but like he was at the skywalker ranch and like kind of fits with the time there and then like the new york times also reported that it was supposedly true in 2001 so like at the time i guess there was like enough that it sounds like there was that actually did happen, but I just I can't picture Colin Hanks like as as Anakin. When was Orange County? That same year. Okay, well, it came out the same year. Yeah, because I, I I remember him in that, and I can't imagine him playing anything yeah. serious or remote or like just doing know. like those like Hanks like freakouts. <laughs> yeah. It's a family trait. <laughs> yeah. uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was also very seriously considered for uh, for a long time. Right, a long time. The good money was on him. Interesting. And then he another also... one was James Vanderbeek. But then, like, I found a thing where he said that he said it's possible that it was like talked about, but he never auditioned or anything. So yeah, I remember those rumors at the time. Like, what was this freak out at the time? Like, was this like a specific moment in like nerd culture and like the turf wars of nerd culture? Like, I remember as a high schooler, there was this like pervading sense that like a James Vanderbeek, if like a James Vanderbeek or someone who was like popular with teeny bopper girls was cast as Anakin, like it was going to be like a travesty. <laughs> and I don't quite know. It's like kind of hard for me now to to put myself back in that headspace. But like, I mean, that was a real thing. Like there was even, I mean, this is true. There was a cameo that some of the members from from InSync shot where they were Jedi in the arena battle. And they cut it out of the movie because of the backlash from the fans when news of that leaked. And it's kind of like, what is that? It's like, is that like a nerd kind of like a gatekeeping thing where it's like you can't have. Yeah, your, I, like... I think so. Yeah. That's so weird. Isn't that weird? Yeah, it is. But I want to see. It's like, is, can you watch that footage? <laughs> is that somewhere? That... I don't think you can watch that footage. <laughs> like, You would have to like raid the archives at. <laughs> <laughs> Skywalker Ranch. I, I mean, it would be ridiculous if they like cut to the shot, and then uh, I feel like there's a forty percent chance that this is how it like would have been. Like if they cut to them and like what are their songs? Like it just like a uh, drop, like kind of drops like uh, for a second, like as, in their shot, <laughs> and they were just, and they were kind of like dancing, like as they were fighting, cantina band style version of their music. <laughs> yeah. There's a shot in the movie that I think a lot of people conflated the the news of them sh shooting the cameo and like projected it on to the shot in their minds. But, but the two Jedi who throw the lightsabers light to Anakin and Obi-Wan, um, a lot of people were like, that's the in sync cameo. Yeah. I, I actually rewound that several times. Cause I'm like, why does that guy like, it does look like something. Yeah. yeah like he just weird has like a on. weird, like <laughs> goatee facial hair thing. Yeah. And, like sideburns. And like, it's it like, almost it, looks like, sort uh, of like a boy band kind of look. Yeah, it's like a really bad uh, like Hugh McGregor like stunt double or something. Yeah. And he's like throwing uh, it to queuing it up. Yeah, I'm 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 looking through it right now. But yeah, they're very often uh they're erroneously reported as the in sync cameo. <laughs> and it's not actually it's not actually them. Um <laughs> but they're often mistaken for them. Um closing thoughts on this movie, guys. I mean, like I said, I think it transcends it yes, transcends good sure. and bad. <laughs> Right. And it's both. Yeah. It's both and neither. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think it could be it could be fun. I recommend everyone watch the Hell Hell Nine Thousand cut and never revisit the theatrical cut. Unless you want to compare them, uh just stick to the Hell Nine Thousand. I think it's it makes it work for me. It make it, it, it that, that relationship between Anakin and, and Padme works in this in the film. Uh his performance being trimmed works. 
it's 25 minutes shorter by the way uh, uh, and like that's including like some added in scenes so it's like that's a lot of cringe half hour remote. that's a lot of cringe yeah. that was trimmed like it, 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 but then like a lot of that is just like trimming scenes down like, yeah there's a lot of like i said before when they go into the club like they and they walk in that's like in like 45 seconds where they kind of amble in and like they have that kind of dialogue that doesn't make any sense and then they're like looking around and it's like point of view and like you can see like the like whatever like fo- kind of like star wars football game on the screen <laughs> <laughs> yeah the set dressing isn't good enough to to like linger there it, like it wasn't exciting it wasn't like hey look at the weird creatures here it's like look at these like 2000s era like human teenagers dressed <laughs> up with like wild like fr- frizzy hair like it was not good um i definitely recommend uh free framing your way through that sequence to investigate if you have the time um but yeah, it's it's really a mixed bag. When it, like some production design is amazing, some is uh, like non Star Wars. It, it's really it could be a case study in in figuring out how to make a Star Wars film look like Star Wars. <laughs> um, I think it's I think it's worth revisiting. I think the fact that it's a Star Wars noir is interesting. Um, I like I think the Camino stuff is great. Um, if you want to get into some Boba Fett backstory that was never needed, uh, it's all there. It, it's um, and and some of yeah some of the uh, the space uh, space flight stuff looks good. You got a solar sail. Um, I do have one one closing thought that sometimes the score preempts itself too much. So John Williams brings in the, the Imperial March, which I, I always identified as Darth Vader's theme personally. Um, and he brings it in when they're like loading up the ships at the end when they're when they're looking off the balcony. And I'm like, ah, I felt that it was out of place. I'm like, you're bringing in a theme that's really not ready to come out yet. Um, and so I thought that was a little bit of a yeah. push. So I don't know. All, all those things aside, I think, you know, with watching the Hal cut, uh, it, it's, 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 yeah, you could do it. Get into it. <laughs> you know, pop some popcorn. <laughs> 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 No, yeah, you can find the HAL 9000 cut if you go to originaltrilogy.com, uh, the forums there. And if you, I mean, or if you Google it, I'm sure, I'm sure you could find the HAL 9000 cut. I believe he's retitled Attack of the Clones, The Gathering Storm. Nice. I don't know what title I prefer. I don't love The Gathering Storm, but I also, I also equally don't love Attack of the Clones. And I don't know, I don't know why I don't love Attack of the Clones, because if you think about it, it's not that far off from The Empire Strikes Back. What about the gathering yeah. clones, like clone party? <laughs> the gathering. <laughs> Send in the clones. Clone gatherings? <laughs> I'd watch those. Um, like the clone convention. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the clone convention. Uh, At the Coruscant Hilton. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I think, uh, I think we've said a lot about this movie. <laughs> Probably um, too much. Probably too much. <laughs> yeah. If you like what you heard, transcripts of this episode and all our other episodes are available at TrashCompod.com, and we are TrashCompod across all social media, and we will see you on the next one.